Welcome back, everyone. So before the break, we saw how Michael put his bid together and put that concept design together. Um, he's been successful, as I mentioned, so we'll now see how Michael takes the work he's done at concept design stage through into develop design. So over to you, Michael. Thank you, Clive. Yes. I knew I'd get there. All that digital flexing and, yeah, it's worked, hasn't it? So, okay, so I guess this is where the, the fun starts, really. Um, I've got that appointment. Even more important, I know that I'm going to be novated into the construction phase as well. So I'm really going to start to focus now on not creating too many mistakes for myself later on. I'm really going to start to think about the technical integrity of this. I'm going to start to think about how this detail works, and I'm going to start to think about things like maybe a common data environment before going and playing around a round of golf later on this afternoon to celebrate. Um, I need to understand how I'm going to manage the files. As the BIM information manager, the model information manager in this particular case, I'm going to write that BIM execution plan. I'm going to manage the people I'm working alongside. And I'm going to reflect back against that EIR with the data drops that were defined by the client. Um, I want to make sure that the right detail is put into these models at the right time by the right people. I don't want to overmodel at the wrong time. Um, so we've got to put together something called the common data environment. Now, it's usually my response. I'm going to take responsibility uh, this time around. And I'm sure there are many of you out there that have been practicing these processes and are fully aware. But actually, to start off with, everybody's models sitting in your own environment. It's sitting in that work in progress domain. And in accordance with the BEP, I'm going to validate that information, federate those models on a bi-weekly basis. And I'm happy with that. I'm going to push that out to the shared world. And ultimately, it's going to be pushed out into the published world. Now, at that point in time, I can start to use that model information because it's coordinated and because it's being collaborated and it's being checked as being appropriate and fit for purpose. I can start to share that maybe with some of the subcontractors that might be sitting around the outside of this environment because we may have a contractor on, on board earlier. But I can definitely push it out to the QS. We can start to get a little bit of cost certainty around that. Um, I'd like to bring your attention to PAS 1192-5-2015. Remember what Paul said earlier on? He's got quite a secure database of information as a solicitor. And as such, I want to make sure that I am adhering to that um, and that we can adhere to his security requirements. So at this stage, control of modeling is paramount. And I'm sure we've all got experiences of when those controls get out of kilter. But how am I going to specify and control um, through this phase of work with so many different options and definitions being banded around, in particular with level of detail, level of definition. We've got the RIBA plan of works. We've got LOD within 1192. We've got the AIA from the states telling us what um, a level of detail. We've got the MJ version here, and I expect we've got the Steve Rudge version down the front there. So just remember that the holy grail of definition is going to be contained in the BIM execution plan that I actually put together myself. So if we look at the drawing, it's always been relatively easy to understand the level of detail of a drawing because it was a scale. And we all understand historically what scale of drawing and information is needed at what particular point. Um, when we start to chat about such things as metadata and information, um, is it getting confusing? Actually, no, I don't think it is. I, I think it's a relatively simple process, but it is all to do with understanding what and how. So, for example, I don't want to over-specify the level of detail or the level of information relating to a chair, for example, that I'm putting into the model now as an architect that might be replaced or removed by a contractor later. Um, I'm led to believe they do something called value engineering, um, sim similar to which balances the specification. So really at this point in time, the only information that I can probably hang my, ha hang my hat on as being right and will be right going forward is space-related information. Now space-related information is a good starting point because we know that that's critical to Paul in the management of that uh, building going forwards. So 
what I want to manage now is, is the who, the what, and when, and indeed the how. Who has ownership of information? Um, what information? What information is required at what time? And how is that information structured and saved? Now, I'm going to do that using model element table. Um, I know there's a growing awareness of the importance of this document sitting inside that BIM execution plan. Um, and I'd like to pay reference to both the RIBA and the BIM task group for helping us out here and giving us a little bit of a steer um, when giving this guidance you know, around when and what and where and how. So maybe we could look at the MBS toolkit and see how that might help us. So again, looking here, RIBA stages of work against the level of detail. We're going to start off by just looking at a very high level um, in the left-hand side here. So maybe we're just looking at group elements, for example, doors and windows. If we move on to the next stage, we can see the details being embellished, much the same as we're running as a theme throughout today. So it's now a single leaf door. We're adding more detail to that. Um, I'm adding more detail again. I'm looking at the classification. I'm looking at the fire rating. Um, and I'm now starting to look at who is managing under what auspices. Are we using Uniclass as a classification system here? Um, who's responsible for the modeling of that information and in what file format? So it's actually going to be managed within Revit, within a Revit model. Who's going to be managing that Revit model? Well, actually, it's going to be managed in this particular element case by the architect. So we're really starting to push responsibility into the appropriate domain here uh, and make sure that things aren't duplicated, more importantly. And then we move on to the level of detail that's going to be required, so the geometry around that particular element. Is it a placeholder? Does it have more of a look and feel of reality? Again, I know Steve's going to talk about this later on this afternoon. And the level of information. And just to make sure that you know, if we're not responsible for the procurement of this product, leave it as a placeholder, okay? Because we're just giving ourselves commercially more work to do on something that's going to be swapped out at a later stage. I think data is a theme that we've been talking about all day, so you know, that's it, I've sorted it. Um, I know now that the BIM execution plan, along with the model element table, is going to start to define the who, the what, the when. I'm getting the right data in the right time. But more importantly, as an architect, I'm actually beginning to understand um, the importance I'm playing in the smooth management of this building when it's actually completed, by creating the right data sets now, by recognizing the client's needs back against the EIR, I'm now starting to inform people going forward. So I think we're doing a good job here. Okay. It's time for a bit more TV. So let's look at how we're going to create some, door, some, some, some floor plans. We're taking the model which we created earlier, and as you can see, it's been developed to a greater level of detail. We've taken out the placeholder elements and started to put in some more interesting fenestration. So there's some cladding there, which is showing more my, my detailed thoughts of this process. Information's always going to be needed in a two-dimensional world, I think, for some foreseeable time. Uh, we're going to get information on pieces of paper at the coalface being used to construct. So what we need to understand here is, although we're creating these wonderful three-dimensional models, we can see here we've even got to the level of detail with some furniture in here, I need to get some output into a piece of paper. And how do we do that? How easy is it to create a first floor plan and actually push this out onto um, a drawing sheet? So it's not a difficult uh, process at all. As you can see from here, we're just going to pick uh, an, an A sheet here. There's my drawing sheet. It's being numbered as part of the convention set out again in the BIM execution plan. So I'm taking the ambiguity out of naming conventions and I'm simply going to drag that drawing, that view out and put it onto the sheet as we can see there. It's brought in the, the, the naming conventions, it's brought in the scale. Um, let's not be driven by technology though. If I want to change the name of that view, then it's a relatively simple process to change the name of that view uh, in the database and see that reflected there very clearly in the drawing sheet that I'm going to be issuing. I'm quite happy with that. Um, sometimes on a Friday afternoon, again, creating outputs from CAD was quite a challenge and it took quite a long time. So again, showing really the ease of use here as to how we can actually get information out into that paper environment. 
Up until now, we've just been working with architectural elements. But if you remember that I am a multidisciplinary business, and I've got a structures team. The structures team have been beavering away downstairs, um, jumping at the bit, but they really want to start to get involved in the modeling process as well. So we know we went for um, a steel frame building. Um, it works on time, it works on cost. My guys downstairs have had a quick look at the engineering as well, and they agree with that process for floor loadings and we've agreed on a grid dimension. So it's a relatively simple process here to march along the building and using the, the grid dimensioning tools inside Revit, set out an intelligent grid system. Now again, it's great to see, for those of you who can't remember, once upon a time you had to go around the end of grid lines and um, putting circles and numbering them, getting the numbers out of sync occasionally and creating all sorts of organizational issues. Very simplistic, organizing bubbles. We can do the same in the longitudinal direction and we can start to build up a very good picture of this sensible grid. Now, the grid has intelligence um, over and above other methods I've used in the past to, to draft. I'm going to be able to use this for tying, ele tying in elements of the building, both from an MEP point of view, a structural point of view, and from an architectural point of view, placing walls, etc. laterally. We can snap onto these. And there's an example of how we're going to snap on here. Um, I can start to go up to my structures tab and pick a column. In this particular case, I'm going to pick a 305, 305, 97. And I want to place that as fast as I can, as commercially efficiently as I can across that grid. So it's a relatively simple process to identify all grid intersections and place that element straight into every one of those grid intersections or so. Now, not forgetting that it's a three-dimensional world. If we have a look at our three-dimensional section and push that back, it's very clear to see that the, uh, the element is sitting there in the building, albeit slightly too high. Um, again, one of the great features here is we can bind that back down to the appropriate level, in this case, up to the underside of the, of the roof deck. So, once again, Commercially, my point of view, sitting in a multidisciplinary office, I've now got my structural guys working inside an architectural element, and the steel is in the right place. It's being coordinated effectively, even at this early stage. Let's not forget that we've got to go up onto the roof as well. So in this particular shot, you can see I've taken out the roof element, and I can very clearly see the roof uh, beams, trusses sitting in the model here. Um, we can then start to turn off the other architectural elements. So we can turn off the doors, the walls, the windows, etc., using uh, visibility graphics here to actually isolate those steel members, to actually understand uh, in more detail, to verify that I'm actually designing this as I intended to. But again, it's all happening with inside that, that one world environment. So just clicking through here and turning off the elements that we don't need Hopefully what we're going to see in a minute is this identified, collaborated, coordinated uh, image of our structural design. Now, I know we've had coordination in this industry for years and years, but my experience is actually to have a set of architectural drawings and steelwork drawings and latterly MEP drawings all originating from the same space is going to maybe give me, in some cases, allegedly slightly better coordination that has happened in the past. So there we go, a very clear representation of our structural design to date. Well, I mentioned that um, it's, a, uh, it's a multidisciplinary practice, so now what I want to do is show how easy it is to integrate the MEP data into what up until now has just been architectural and structural. So the first things we have to do is to reference in the architect's models, uh, as we've done before. That's a key, key aspect here again, is creating and locating the acquired coordinates. I don't want this building being located in Enfield and the MEP somewhere out in Wembley. Um, so let's actually get the same uh, reference points. Let's start to use some of the information that's already been recreated for me. So I want to copy monitor, for example, the, the grid that's being defined and designed in accordance with the architect by the structural engineer. Okay? I'm going to start to use these valuable reference points to bind my and to link my MEP geometry to at a later stage. So you can see I'm very clearly just copy monitoring these uh, grid lines here, 
Um, they're owned by the structural engineer. I don't want to be changing them. I don't want responsibility for that. I'm an MEP engineer. But I do want to be informed of any changes they might make to their design. So by copy monitoring their grid rather than just creating my own, I'm getting synchronicity through those disciplines straight away. And in the same way, you can see here, we're doing exactly the same thing, and we're copy monitoring the, the slab levels as well. So I'm fixed in those X, Y, Z um, coordinates now. Now that's going to give me great confidence when I start to pop in MEP elements um, later in the day. So that's my positioning done. Um, I'm now going to create a mechanical, um, mechanical drawing. So this is a mechanical uh, layer. I'm going to create it on the first floor. And I'm going to think about um, some of the, the, the MEP aspects and placing some of these MEP aspects into the model. Now, bearing in mind I'm working in a two-dimensional plane here, um, I'm very readily available to me are a set of tools to pick a rectangular duct, to set its height, to set its width, to set its section. All relatively simple CAD-related type processes, but I'm also creating this third dimension as well. So there we see a run of duct, um, and I think we can then see how easy it's going to be to view that. We can put a section line through, just to ensure that I'm not purely working in two dimensions here. My, my, my experience is that things like ducts and pipe and bits of steel and glazing have this tendency to migrate towards one another. So I can clearly see here, having pushed that section through, that I'm coordinated into the space that I'm expecting to be able to fill with MEP information. So there's my duct. It's sitting in section. Um, there's my plan. You can see how easy that was to create. And I'm happy that I'm starting to build um, something here that is the foundation going forward. In the same way, we could start to place cable trays. Uh, again, we can set offsets, whereabouts it is in that void. We can set its section type. We can pick its section type. And we can place that alongside the geometry of that duct, as we see going in here. So there we see it. Uh, we will in a minute, apologies. So again, just setting up the, 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 the data that's sitting behind here, uh, which is going to form the basis for some of the, the management of this process later on. So it's quite important to keep referring back to that original EIR. What did the client want these services to be called when loaded into their FX3 system? Okay? I don't want to call my pipe ducts. I don't want to call my uh, cable trays something different as a service name than Paul is going to use latterly in his project. So there we can see cable tray, pick it up, duplicate it in the same manner that I'm used to doing in CAD, appoint a particular service to that. In particular case here, it's, it, it, it's a service, it's uh, signaling. Another one here we're going to put in is the fire trays. So we know we've got separation of our systems here. I'm confident of that. I can not just see it in plan, I can see it here in the uh, third dimension, in the second dimension in section as well. And it's quite coordinated. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm using two dimensional graphics, which I'm used to. Um, I can now start to put in that third element. We could pick pipe layout. Again, define where it's going to go to. I know it sits between those two elements there. And hey presto, we are seeing that in our, our sectional view as well. So again, this, this, this great warm feeling I have for knowing that I'm not pushing things through other elements above ceilings where they shouldn't be through pieces of steel, etc. Um, I can actually start to, um, I think we're going to just quickly pop back through into the uh, 3D view in a minute, but there we see our pipe. I'm going to appoint some materials to it, again thinking further outside of my remit, but what value can I add to the contractor here by adding materials for Steve to do a very early takeoff of this project laterally. So it's not just geometry, it's about the information that we were discussing earlier. Again, it's a relatively simple process to replicate those um, in the third dimension. And I've got confidence that it's, it's part of the right system. It's been allocated to the right system. That system is replicating FX360 um, earlier on discussed. So notwithstanding the fact I've been working in 2D, and that's great for my team's maturity. I'm not suddenly having to model in this third dimension. I'm modeling in the two-dimensional world, but creating those very easily and very clearly seen 
three-dimensional outputs there, which pleases me. Um, again, you know, coming back to the point that I've now got architectural, structural, and the MEP elements all sitting in the same 3D view is, is a great position for me to be in at this point in time in the project. So I'd like to look here at how all this information we've been talking about actually adds to the value of what we've been doing. We've been talking about geometries, uh, and we've also been talking about information. So what I want to look at here is how, for example, we start to tag information within the geometry. In this particular case, we're going to look at tagging room information. Room information, really valuable, coming back to Paul, coming back to his EIR. He wants rooms of a particular type. He wants them of a particular size. And I need to validate that very early on. If I get this wrong, my design's not going to be fit for purpose. Any of you guys that work in the hospital environment will probably know that in more detail than I do. But here we can see very clearly that the imagery being shown on the drawing on the right-hand side is being mirrored by the information put into the database on the left. It's an extremely bi-directional process. Um, what I want to be able to do now is start to create a schedule, room schedules, door schedules. It's always historically been a nightmare keeping the geometry up with the Excel spreadsheet that's changed on a Friday afternoon. I'm always the last one to the pub. Um, so how can I do that more efficiently? Well, Revit, we know, can drive the databases, drive the information out of the geometry into those schedules, which, again, has a massive value. Um, if I can look at how easy it is here to, to sort the information, to define what my particular schedule needs to look like at this time, organize the hierarchy of the information, the look and the feel I want to adhere to my schedules, not just what comes flat out of the box. And here we see a very simple room schedule created instantaneously. Now, we know the importance of keeping the schedule up to the drawings, and we know here the process, and we can see here the process. If I change something in the geometry, it's actually being replicated and changed in the room schedule as well. That's a first. That's not scampering off trying to find out which Excel spreadsheet to chain and what did I call that room and which room number was it. So again, I'm, I'm feeling very confident about the ability of my office to deliver a coordinated data set out, uh, let alone working with any of the external consultants. So it's a relatively simple process to then place a, a room uh, tag into each one of the rooms. We could do this automatically where the system would go off uh, and find all bound rooms in this particular case, we're just going to do that manually. So what about using this model for other aspects of analysis? Uh, we touched on shadowing earlier on, but now I've engaged with my MEP engineers. I could look at energy analysis and early energy analysis. So what we're going to do here is to, in the same way we placed uh, room tags, we're going to place space tags. And we're going to put these MEP tags into each room, and you'll see on the left-hand side there, that the data it's producing is very much related to MEP outputs as opposed to the traditional areas and volumes shown in the architectural world. So I can see lighting, I can see wall reflectors, I can actually start to see the loads that I might be required into these areas related to those volumes that we've placed into the model earlier on. So again, very early analysis, very early information that we're going to use to perform tasks at a far earlier stage than I might have done earlier. In the same way that we change the tags on the rooms, we can change the tags in the spaces here, align the two, they now have the same number and the same meeting, the, the same definition. We could do this automatically, but from the point of showing here, that's the process. So adding more spaces again, run these spaces round through the model. One of the points worth, a point worth mentioning here is we've now got space and room tags in the same area. So be careful when you're picking up these elements and manipulating them. Um, just remember that we've got rooms for architects and spaces for the MEP team, and we don't want to confuse one with the other. So the good news is that we're now matched. We have created those room tags, and if I'm lucky, we'll be able to see that those spaces have enabled us to reflect very much on the requirements of, of MEP, um, and that's going to form the basis for analysis um, when we move out of Revit into a third party. So what we've actually done here is we simply run, I do apologize,
we, we, uh, what we actually did was run the analysis um, using the EPC reports, using IES. Uh, Revit was an extremely positive tool for creating the, 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 the boundings and the rooms because we all know to get our EPC reports, we've had to push it out into um, IES. So getting our renders out of that imagery at the end of the day was just as important for me. Um, and again, just proving that reuse of information and how succinctly it was and how simple it was to create those rendered images. Something that I might have had to have done historically um, by paying external consultants. Uh, and again, creating this issue with time, having to stop my design process while someone continues doing something else. So, finally, wanting to look at creating some elevations. Um, we've been talking all the way through about modeling. We need to get this information into a two-dimensional environment for the planners to actually engage with the client. So what you can see here is I've placed some tags um, around our floor plan. Uh, these tags are going to enable me to identify the appropriate elevations and create elevations that are dynamic. Um, for those of you out there that are in charge of drawing offices, I'm sure we all recognize the challenge of keeping plans up to date with what's today's live section, what's that elevation actually looking like, has somebody changed something, uh, and it becomes, becomes a challenge. Um, so it's very easy here to actually create these elevations, as, I, as we can see from here, um, actually give them a name. The name doesn't have to be defined by the system, so I'm going to call this the north elevation, and equally so, east, west, and south. I'm going to give those um, some view names, and we'll then be able to see how simple it is to move this off of this space into an output-based environment. So bear with me. Here we go. So that's straight off of that model. That's a view of that model. Now, it's got a lot of clutter in there that I don't want to see. I don't want things like that. I don't want grid markers. I don't want sectional markers. I don't want grid lines on my, on my model, on my output to the local authority. So again, I need to do some decluttering. Um, and I can declutter quite simply by going back into, uh, into visual graphics and turning off the elements in the same way that we did with the architectural and engineering elements earlier. So we can see here, we turn the, turn the information off. And what I'm hoping to see is a far decluttered, more architecturally appealing um, piece of geometry and graphic that I'm going to feel confident when talking with the local authority and the, uh, the client. So here we see it's getting far smarter. I think we've got some grid lines on the end there that we still need to get rid of. So again, back into visual graphics, let's look at any associated files, imported categories, turn those off, um, and any links to associated files, we can turn those off as well, with great confidence because we know the structure of how this information has been put together. I've still got some grids and some trees. Um, it's not a complicated procedure to move those grids out from the trees. And there we have something that I really am now confident about um, and feel happy that I can put that pen to paper effectively. Um, maybe we can need some, some coloring, some bringing to life, some shadows. We've seen how easy that's been to do in the past. So once I'm happy with that image, which, which I think I am, it's representative of that elevation today. Um, it's coordinated with the plans of today. Um, and I can start to give it some architectural texture. I can give it the look and feel that's similar to the type of output I would have issued from my office um, in a more manual or a CAD environment. So again, showing how simple it is to come back into the graduated sky environment. And I've now got something that it's informative. It works for me at this stage of the game. Um, and I'm happy to move on. So. We've had a look at some of the outputs, we've developed the models, and we really have now to, to think about how we can develop information that might have otherwise been delivered from third parties externally. Um, by using this consistent set of modeling tools surrounding the EIR and supporting the EIR, we've actually got something I believe is far better than the position I've been in before. Internal renders um, used to be a stop-start process, pushing this information out to others to do on my behalf. It's now there. I can use them as work in progress examples. I can put them on the table to discuss with clients at a very early stage. 
I can even start to look at the FF and E elements, the colors, the fit, the feel, work with my interior designers, and I can push this back all the time straight at the, at the client. Is this what you're thinking? Are you happy with this? I don't want to get to a stage where it's inappropriate and we have to start again. So again, I think I'm using the right tools for the right jobs, um, and I'm a happy man. We've developed the design. Um, we've looked at the common data environment. I've recognized my responsibilities as lead consultant. I've written a detailed uh, BIM execution plan, that holy grail of who's doing what and when. I've understood the levels of detail and the level of information. We've integrated structure and MEP into this coordinated model, and I'm happy that that's fitting. So from my point of view as an architect, I'm very pleased and I feel that I can progress confidently to the next stage. Okay, thank you, Michael. Okay, so that's the developed design stage completed. Uh, two things to sort of reinforce there. First of all, the common data environment, and we've seen how absolutely critical it is to get that in place early. Uh, it is that single point of truth, uh, so that it means that as the different disciplines start to develop the design, they're all working from the same core data. Um, and also, we've seen there that can be made available to the client for him to keep track of uh, the way the design is, um, is, is, is progressing. The other thing that's key there is obviously the, the value of the BIM execution plan, um, particularly from the point of view of design productivity, the last thing we want is too much data going into that model too soon. If we end up with um, bloated models, you know, productivity will drop, they'll become more difficult to use. So again, the BIM execution plan sets out exactly uh, what's required and when. Okay, um, we're gonna come to an interesting part of the day today. Um, David spoke earlier about a networking opportunity, and this is it. Um, the challenge we've got today is with nearly 400 people in the audience, it's just a logistical 